welcome to the First Congregational Church, where everyone's someone and Jesus is Lord. This morning we're going to be looking at Acts 16, and we're going to see that God's ways are certainly not our ways. In fact, following God often leads us on a very strange path. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you find a way to apply this to your life over the coming weeks. Before we start, let's pray and ask for God to open our eyes. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father. Thank you for drawing us to you, and thank you for the strange path you've got us on. Help us to know that path, to open, to see that path clearly, and to follow you in all that we do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the guiding us and leading us by the power of your Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you remember, way back, years and years ago in January, we started the book of Acts. And what we said then is Acts is pretty much the history of the gospel moving across the world. But we have to be careful not to read it like a travel log, right? It's not like watching someone's vacation video. First we went here, and then we went there, and then we did this, and then we did that. I mean, there's a lot of that in here, right? I mean, that's what this was about, is what happened, and what they saw, and what they did. And, and it's good stuff, and we need to know it, absolutely. But if we just read it like that, then we've missed a lot. So today I want to look at it a little bit differently. Uh, and I want to look at this chapter uh, with the theme of uh, God's ways are not our ways. And what a strange path he has us walking on. Um, you know, there's basically three events in this chapter. And each one of them go away, uh, go in a direction that we think is at least I think, perhaps you agree with me, is strange. It's just, it's weird that God would have people do this. So, so let's look at these three ways and, and try to understand why it's weird that God did these things and how we can apply it to our lives. All right, so first of all, we have, um, the, this is the second missionary journey. Um, you can see on the map up there, uh, again, on the far right side is Syria, and then Antioch is the major city there. And uh, Barnabas takes Mark, and he sails um, to Cyprus. And Paul takes Silas, and they go north up to towards Tarsus. So that's, the, that's where we are. Um, and as Paul is going along, do you remember why they decided to go? Why are they making this journey, Barnabas one way and Paul the other? First of all, because they had a big fight and they were mad at one another, so they went different directions. Uh, but second of all, they wanted to bring the good news from the Jerusalem Council. Right? Remember that dotted line on your map up there? That is their travel back and forth to Jerusalem for the great Jerusalem Council that we talked about last week. And do you remember what they decided at the Jerusalem Council? They decided that you did not have to be circumcised or to keep the religious laws in order to be a Christian. Right? Hallelujah. The church rejoiced. Everybody was thrilled. We don't have to do these things anymore. And so the first thing then we see during this journey is, is Paul in chapter 16. He gets um, he meets this guy, Timothy, and, and Timothy becomes a strong supporter and a follower. And so in verse um, 3, it says, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So this great, joyful council that said, you don't have to be circumcised anymore, the first thing Paul does is he circumcises Timothy. Is that strange? I think it's strange. I think it's really weird. Fortunately, it tells us why he did it. He did it because the people who they were going to be ministering to, knew that Timothy was half Jewish and half Greek. And, and it seems like, it doesn't really spell this out, but it seems like Paul didn't want Timothy's lack of circumcision to hurt the ministry. They were going to be sharing this gospel with Jewish people, and we already said there was a big argument among the Jews, and so Paul wanted Timothy to be able to say, this is the truth, and yes, I am a circumcised person. Now, that's, that's strange, but sometimes it's the same for us. Sometimes God asks us to do things, strange things, things that we are not required to do for the sake of his kingdom, right? I mean, for instance, uh, the easy, low-hanging fruit this morning is we have asked you all to wear masks, 
right? Now, you don't have to wear a mask out in the, in the world today. Um, very few places are actually requiring them. But of course, it's a good thing to do, right? It's good for the other people, good for the people that you run into. Uh, and so, in some ways, the kingdom of God is the same way. We do things that are good for other people. We put aside our rights not to be circumcised in Timothy's case, or perhaps not to be baptized, or uh, perhaps go to church at a different time that I would want to go, or sing a different kind of music, or wear a different kind of clothing, all these kind of religious things that we are willing to put aside for the sake of the gospel. A real good example from my life is, I've told you before, and I won't do the whole story for, for sake of time, but I believed, and Laura concurred, that I was being called to a particular Bible school as I prepared for ministry, right? It was a, uh, the Breed Bible Institute in Slinger, Wisconsin, and uh, they had a rule there that if you wanted to go to their school, that men had to wear ties. Now, I thought that was a stupid rule. But that was the rule. And so I had to decide, am I going to follow God and do what he's calling me to do, or am I going to say, forget it, I'm not going to wear a tie? That's a dumb one, right? So I guess I wore the tie and I crabbed about it. And, and it, some of the students there, they got it where they tried to get the ugliest tie they could possibly wear to, just to meet the requirement of tie wearing. Um, but the, the, the leaders of the school there, they thought that uh, ties, uh, having us wear ties would help us understand that there were sometimes things that we needed to do to minister, and we had to be willing to put our own pride aside in order for that to happen. You've done that before, right? You've all put aside some sort of right in order to further the kingdom of God. Would we do that in this church? Would we? It depends on what God is calling us. Everyone, when I ask the question, I know you have masks on, so it's hard to do. You all say, yes, we will do whatever God calls us to do in order to further the kingdom of God. And yes, we would, unless he asks us to do something we don't want to do. Right? I mean, that's the key. When, when we are going through our strange path that God has called us to walk, there's always a temptation to say, no, I, I have a right. I don't have to do that. I have a desire. I don't want to do that. That's inconvenient for me. I don't have time to do that. There's always things on this path that God will call us to do that we know isn't required of us, and yet God is calling us for a specific reason, for spe specific purpose. And in this case, Timothy was being called to be circumcised so that he could reach the Jewish people that they were going to speak with. So that's strange, right? That's, that's number one. That's, that's strange. So the first point, if you're actually keeping an outline, which I know we don't pass out anymore, but the first point is sometimes we have to make unrequired concessions. Sometimes we have to put other people's needs above our own. Second thing that happens in this chapter that we see here, uh, and I think we've probably all experienced this in some way, is unexpected life events. Right? Things that happen in your life that you didn't expect and perhaps you didn't want, and yet God called you or moved you into it, into that direction, um, again, for your good and for the good of his kingdom. We see that here. Um, yeah, again, if we look at the map, we see uh, we started at Antioch and then we went to Tarsus and Derby, and that's where we met Timothy. And then we went to Lystra and then Iconium, right? And so when they got up there, Paul wanted to go, he wanted to take a right turn. He wanted to go up, uh, that's Asia, Asia, uh, main Asia over there, Cappadocia type of thing. He wanted to go that way, but, but the Holy Spirit prevented him from doing it. And so they, they kept going and they decided to go to Bithynia. You can see Bithynia kind of up by the Black Sea up there. You know, Paul, wanted, or Paul wanted to go that way. He had a plan. He knew, he knew what he wanted to do. But we read in verse 7, and when they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So God didn't allow them to go where they wanted to go, even though they had a good plan. Now, why would God want that? Why did God say no? You know, there's, there's a lot of people over there in Asia. There's a lot of people up there in Bithynia who would really benefit from hearing the gospel of God. Did God not want those people to know him? Did God not want those people to hear the, of the gospel of the grace of God? Of course.
course not. God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But at this point, God was setting up the, the Greece, Grecian Peninsula, and he was preparing people there. He was preparing hearts, and he was preparing um, churches to be formed. He was getting ready. And so even though it doesn't say, Paul didn't know why, God said, no, not, you're not going to Bithynia. And he sent a, a dream and said, you're going to Macedonia, which is uh, across, that's where uh, Philippi is, as you can see. They, they, after they make that hard left turn, and they go over to Greece. Um, why? Why did God want them to do that? It was for because he had because God's plan is better. And the same for us. Sometimes in our lives, well, always in our lives, God's plan is better. And sometimes it doesn't fit with our plans. Um, I, I've used George Mueller as an example before. So hopefully you all remember George Mueller was a, a gentleman in uh, early 1800s, and he wanted to be a missionary. I mean, he just wanted that so bad, and he prepared himself, and he went and he applied to the missionary society, and they rejected him. They said, no, no, you're not good enough. You're not qualified enough. Or you're not going to go there. But God had a plan for George Mueller. And George Mueller ended up staying in England and starting orphanages, and hundreds of thousands of young men and women came to Christ through these orphanages that George Mueller uh, started and, and funded uh, through prayer and through the work of God. Uh, George Mueller, though rejected, God by the Missionary Society was not rejected by God, and God had a better plan for George. Um, it's the same in my life. God has had a better plan for me than my own plan. I, I think I've told you before, uh, before I came to this church, there was another church that I really thought I was going to. I mean, I thought we had a good connection, and and we were working together, and they, they rejected me. They said, no, nope, sorry, you're not our guy. And I see that as God's hand to bring me here. I think this is where God wants me. I have a good confidence in that, and I believe God, I pray that God is using me here. Uh, but I wouldn't be here if that other church had not said no. Um, God uses that. What about you? As you look back over your life, can you see times when you had a plan and you wanted to do something, but, but circumstances or people or just a feeling in your heart said no god has a different plan for you i bet we all can do that i bet throughout our lives every one of us has felt the directing hand of god whether we acknowledge it as that or not and there's a there's a corollary by the way that goes with that the fact that god is guiding us and that is not only has he said no or directed us in the past it means that we can pretty much understand that he has us here for a reason today, that he has directed not just me, but you as well. Each of us are drawn into his purpose as we are trying to follow his plan. If we come before God seeking honestly to follow him, we can believe he will lead us. And I believe that each one of you here today are are seeking God and trying to follow God's plan. So therefore, I can believe that you are right now where God wants you to be. And hopefully you're seeking to serve. You're seeking not just where to be, but how to be and how to serve God wherever you are. There's an old saying that says, bloom where you're planted. Well, God has planted you here. So bloom. See what God is calling you to do and do the work that he's calling you. Um, we continue on. We, we find somebody who did bloom where they're planted. Her name is Lydia. Uh, Paul goes on to Philippi. You see on the, on the map up there, you see where Philippi is. And there he meets a group of people down by the river, and Lydia is one of them. Lydia didn't live in Philippi. She was just passing through, just coincidentally happened to be down by the river when Paul and his team walk up. Lydia was a, a wealthy woman, a merchant woman, a well-educated woman, and um, she heard the grace, of the gospel of the grace of God in Philippi down by that river for the first time. She invited um, Paul to use her, uh, her place or whatever, wherever she was living, to use that as his um, central location, his base of operations. And so Paul begins to preach in Philippi. And, and by the way, you know, these, these names, you should connect them with the letters that we've been seeing and that we'll be seeing in the future. So Philippi was where the Philippians lived. 
And so when you read the Philippians, that's how this church was formed. So Paul begins to preach there in Philippi, um, but he, he soon runs into some problems. Um, and it's a commercial type of problem. The, the people there, some of them are beginning to feel that the, their gods are not being respected and it's hurting them commercially. And you can read about it. Please go back and read Acts chapter 16 after we're done here. And, and so Paul, there's a, there's a riot against Paul, and they're thrown in prison. Uh, for, well, first they're beaten, and then after they're beaten, they're thrown in prison. And uh, we see uh, verse 22, the crowd joined in attacking them. That's Paul and his team. And the magistrates tore garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. So they are... First the crowd beats them, and then the police grab them and beat them, and then they throw them in prison. So unwanted hardships is point three that I'm getting at. Sometimes in God's strange path that he has us on, we will encounter unwanted, and may I say in Paul's case, undeserved hardships. Um, he didn't deserve that. He didn't do anything except try to share the, the gospel of the grace of God. And yet he was beaten and thrown in prison before it. And so he was mad, right? He was angry, right? He was whining and saying, God, why are you doing this? I'm not going to follow you anymore. I don't want to put up with this anymore. No, that's not what happened. Instead, this is the story that you've heard before about Paul and Silas in the prison and um, instead of whining and complaining, they're singing hymns of joy to God in the prison after they've been beaten and unjustly placed there. And as they sing, there's an earthquake and uh, the prison walls are, are breached and they can just get away and they choose not to leave. They choose to stay there in prison instead. Uh, where they can share the gospel with more people. And so, uh, again, I don't have time to go into this too heavily right now, but the point is, because of this hardship, because of their beatings, because of the fact they were in prison, because of the way they accepted those hardships and used them to glorify the living God, Philippi ended up with a great Christian church. As people said, this is a God of miracles, these people are they know what they're doing. How, where's this joy coming from? And so people believed and people came to Christ and the kingdom was enhanced, shall we say. Philippi became a major church in the region, a major church in the world. Sufferings bring opportunity for us to, to minister in ways that we wouldn't have otherwise. Have you noticed that in your lives? Where sometimes as you suffer, you have the opportunity to help others, maybe who are suffering in the same way, or be a witness to others, to of, of look what I have to put up with, but you know what, God is in control of all things. How are your hardships working for you today? I mean, none of us are paraplegics, right? None of us have that same type of hardship. And, and I've said before, sometimes I feel like, do we really have any hardships that are worth talking about hardships um, in our lives? And I know some of you do. But how can you use those for the glory of God? How can you have an attitude of, of thankfulness? How can you be in your prison, whatever that looks like, singing hymns of thanksgiving to God so that others will see it and glorify him as well? It's absolutely true that God's ways are not our ways. And it's absolutely true, true that as we walk the path that he has for us, we will find it to be a very strange path. And yet, we have assurance that God will use it for our good and for his glory. So, as Lee plays here in just a moment, take some time and look back and say, how has God directed me to bring me to where I am today? And think about, you know, what's happening in my life that may be a hardship, that maybe I could give God glory and thanksgiving for, so that others may also be able to hear that. And then maybe ask yourself, is God calling me to do something that I'm not required to do, but that I can do and will joyfully do for the good of his kingdom? Whatever that might be, whatever those things are that come to your mind, we have the blessed assurance that Jesus Christ is guiding us and guarding us and using us for his glory. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank you 
We thank you that your path is a strange path. We thank you that your ways are not our ways. And we thank you that we can trust you to bring us to where you want us to be as we faithfully follow. Help us, Father, to have an open heart and open eyes to see that path and the willingness to do whatever it is you're calling us to do. Help us, Lord, to be your people in spirit and in truth and to enjoy the fellowship that you have for us. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you're doing in our